Well, good morning, church. Good to see you guys. Everybody awake? You with us? Good morning. There we go. Finally, good morning. Hey, as we begin today, we're going to teach you a new song for our church. I'm sure you've probably heard this on the, on the radio. This is called God So Loved, and uh, it comes directly from John 3.16, that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So would you stand with us, and the choir is going to teach you guys this, this morning, and I'm going to just invite you to sing with us when you feel comfortable.
Well, good morning, everyone. All right, we wake now. Good morning. See to you. And then they get them going. <laughs> Well, good morning. My name is Tyler Cloyd. I'm the youth pastor here at Greenwood First, and I just want to welcome you this morning. Thank you so much for joining us for worship. If you're a guest this morning, thank you again for just coming to worship with us. We would love to know and connect with you. Um, If you can, there is a little form just like this in front of the seat in front of you. If you could fill that out and at the end of our service, drop that off in one of the giving boxes on your way out. That'd be fantastic. If you're like, I don't want to write on anything. Well, the easiest way is to text the number on the screen there and you just text your name and someone on our staff uh, will reach out to you and connect with you as well. And just, again, any questions you have about our church, any prayer requests that you have, this is also a great tool as well just to connect with us, but also so that we can connect with you. I also want to make you uh, aware of a couple things, uh, both of which are in your bulletin. Graduation Sunday on the inside, May 22nd, that's next week, will be a great time that we get to celebrate our graduates here at Greenwood First. Um, I believe we've got probably most everyone's information, but if you've got a senior uh, who is graduating, of course, and they are going to be here on the 22nd, and you've not contacted Gina Scantling you need to do that. The information is inside in your bulletin. We just got to have some pictures. We need to know what they're doing at the end of when they graduate and what they're going to do after high school, as well as make them aware of our breakfast that we're going to have in the morning. But we're going to do that at our 1045 service. Here is our graduate recognition Sunday. And then secondly, which I think I'm super excited about too, is our family cookout. All right. Now I won't be here for that, unfortunately, because we'll be in New Orleans with our seniors on a mission trip. But um, our family cookout is going to be at Bell Park. And I was going to say, what day is it? June 1st, all right? So that'll be in the evening. And that's going to be a sweet time for the whole family to come. We're going to have some bounce arounds. We're going to have food. Great time of fellowship. And so that'd be a great time to invite friends um, and just, again, have a time as we kick off our summer, all right? Tonight, or excuse me, this morning, we're going to spend some time uh, praying. And you probably, if you were here last week, you had something in your bulletin about the Arkansas Children's Baptist Homes. Arkansas Baptist Children's Homes, excuse me. Um, It had a lot of information about this organization, about this ministry that serves families across the state of Arkansas. And so this morning, we're going to take some time and just pray over this organization. We're going to pray over parents and people that are involved, as well as the many students that it serves and the the children that it serves, um, who, again, when they get displaced for a multitude of reasons, um, it's just hard. And anyone who's ever been in uh, in adoption or in foster care, understand uh, just a lot of the tough things that, that kids go through. So, so thankful for the Arkansas Baptist Children's Home and the ministry that they do to these kids and their families. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you again for your grace. God, thank you again for this time of worship. Thank you for the opportunity we get to gather together. And this morning as we gather, Lord, our, our hearts um, just want to turn to uh, the Arkansas Baptist Children's Home, and, and, and all the people, God, who, who serve in this organization, Father, but also, Lord, for these families and for these, these children, Lord. Father, I pray that, that through your grace that you would draw them to salvation for those that don't know you. Now, that, that they would experience your love through the men and women, through uh, the moms and dads, and the parents and the families that, that they interact with and that they see. And God, I, I, we pray that they would experience that love in such a fresh, profound way that it would draw them to you, Lord. And that they would see, God, just as we who have been far away, God, have been adopted into your family, Father, that they too would feel and experience that adoption as well, God. Not just physically, Lord, here on earth, but also spiritually in their hearts in eternity in heaven. God, we love you, Jesus. We thank you again for your grace. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if you're a visitor here this morning, I want to welcome you as well. My name is Jacob Ray. I'm the worship pastor here, and we are so thankful that you have decided to join us. And this morning, as we begin, we sang this song, God So Love, that came directly from John 3.16. And we're going to continue through, uh, hopefully, you'll, you'll think of pictures that we've studied as we've looked at the, the book of John. And we're going to sing the song, Jesus, that tells these things about what he's done in his life. He walked on the water. He spoke to the sea and all these things. He stands in the fire beside me. Uh, and then, yeah, we're going to sing a Christmas song this morning of, Oh, come let us adore him. It's the first time you've probably ever sung a Christmas song in the month of May. 
But uh, we're going to come and adore the Lord and stand in, in amazement of, of who he is and what he's done and the wonderful love that he's poured out on us. And John writes in the book, in the book of John, in, in chapter 20, he says that these things were written so that you might believe that Jesus is Lord. So that's the path we're on this morning. That's the journey we're walking together. I hope you guys see those things, and I hope it draws your eyes, fixes your eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith this morning. Let's stand. Let's sing together. There is a truth older than the ages. There is a promise of things yet to come. There is one born for our salvation, Jesus. There is a light.
Amen, church. Amen. Please be seated. Well, I was fortunate. Uh, I've been adopted twice. Uh, my first adoption was into my earthly family, and I drew a ace uh, with that family and was raised in church. And like all uh, young people raised in church, I knew all the answers, and I, I walked that aisle at a young age and, uh, you know, checked that box. But uh, as high school and college went on, my fruit proved to be rotten. And uh, I, I give uh, praise for my praying parents. And I know that my praying parents and grandparents were part of me uh, filling that call back for true repentance. And so right at the end of college, uh, I responded to that call and truly repented of my sins and trusted Christ as my Savior and Lord. And as we know, that Lordship is a lifelong journey. And so about that time, my fiance and I both had made that decision separately and the Lord sovereignly moved us and we began to grow together and uh, that's been a growth process for the last 28 years and he's still sanctifying us today and really the, the, the joy of being able to participate with the local body of Christ particularly the life group ministry has probably been the most impactful thing in our spiritual formation. Uh, walking it out every day with, with friends, with, with uh, brothers and sisters that are that same life phase. Of course, the Lord blessed us with five kids, which in itself sanctifies you. And uh, it's been a joy to see that progress. And uh, I continue to grow as we continue to prayerfully uh, watch them all launch and move into their different phases of life. But at this phase of my testimony, what I want to do is just prove to be faithful. And uh, that, that is really on my heart in these days is to finish strong. Steve Farrar wrote that book called Finish Strong. And I know there are so many obstacles and distractions. So we want to run that race set before us with endurance. And that's done by keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. And so that's, that's where we are today in our testimony. Man, I love Jason Turner. You know him, that you know his passion and his heart for the Lord. But... Uh, yeah, just listening to that story again just gives a, a great encouragement. When I was, uh, when I was a little kid uh, growing up, my dad got one week a year vacation, and so we went to the beach. We lived about three hours from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, there on the East Coast, and, uh, and that's where we went. We would camp. My, my dad had bought a pop-up camper, which uh, was interesting back then, but we would, we would head to the beach, and, and I love the beach. I mean, it was a fun way of growing up on those weeks of vacation with my family. But when I was about five years old, I was just a little guy, uh, got to the ocean, and if you know anything at all about the ocean, especially the east coast of the Atlantic Ocean, uh, there's a lot of undertow. Some of you maybe know what undertow is. It's when the, the, the current is, is, the waves are coming in, and as they come in, they obviously will go back out, and there, there's just this current underneath the, the surface that can just kind of drag you out. Well, as a five-year-old kid that year, I got out too far, and I felt myself just being swept further and further, way over my head. I, I was a swimmer then, but I wasn't really good, and I remember I was in trouble. My back was facing the, the, uh, the shore, and, and it was just, I was doing all I could do to keep my head above water. And all of a sudden, I felt an arm come around me, and it was a lifeguard. My sister had seen what was happening. She was watching, and, and so a lifeguard came out there and just grabbed me and just kind of pulled me out of that, that current and got me back safer to the shore. When I was a youth minister, I shared that story because I thought, you know, that's a great picture of salvation. That's what Jesus does. He kind of rescues us. I was, I, was, I was in trouble, and he came and, and put his arms around me, and I was saved. The problem with that, you can use that story, and there's some things in there that, okay, you can, you can relate to salvation. But the more I began to understand salvation, becoming a Christian, what did Jesus do for me? Then I realized that it wasn't that I was 
in trouble and needed to be rescued. I was, I was drowning. No, no, no. It was, I was dead. The Bible says before we were a Christian, we were spiritually dead. We had no spiritual life. In fact, Jesus himself said, salvation is like passing from death to life. Jason's testimony and your testimony, if you're a Christian, is simply a testimony of going from death to life. And I want to ask you a question this morning. First of all, have you put your faith and trust in Christ? Because that's how you go from death to life. You believe. You trust Jesus as your Savior. If you've done that, then you've experienced what it's like to go from death to life. But my second question is this. Are you experiencing that new life? I hear a lot of testimony or people sharing who are Christians, and yet, if you were to look at their life and listen to the way they live, watch the way they live, they're not really living what I believe Jesus came in giving us life and how we're to live. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Well, this morning, our scripture is going to look at two words. And really, it's the two key words in the entire book of John. We've been looking at it from the very beginning. It's the word believe and the word life. Believing in Jesus and experiencing life in him. So I want you to take your Bible and open it up to John chapter 20. We'll finish this chapter this morning. Next week, we'll finish chapter 21. We'll finish the book of John. But this morning, I want us to pick up the story of the resurrection, starting there in verse 19. We'll read all the way down through verse 31. You got your Bible with you? Let's stand as we read God's Word, just in honor of Scripture this morning. Now, again, this is still in the resurrection. It's still Sunday. It's Sunday afternoon, and so here is what John writes. Verse 19. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. And as he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. And again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. One of the twelve disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. And they told him, We have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it until I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and placed my hand into the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time, Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. Verse 28. Thomas exclaimed, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, You believe because you have seen me? Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Verse 30. The disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. Well, let's pray. God, we thank you for just the joy of being here this morning and singing. Lord, just praising you. Thank you for the, the songs that, Lord, have been so uplifting, so truthful about who you are. Lord, I, I thank you for Jason's testimony. Lord, just hearing a man proclaim his story of his faith and trust, his belief in you. 
And God, I pray that you'll use the scripture this morning. That God, it will accomplish in our life what you want it to accomplish. Lord, use it as you're wanting to shape and mold our hearts. We trust you. We commit ourselves to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Go back down to that last verse there, verse 31. Now, it's interesting that John ends this. It's, we, we began this series, it seemed like years ago. We started, I gave the focus of turning to chapter 20, verse 31. Let's look and see right at the outset why John wrote this book. In fact, I, it was kind of interesting because I thought, why didn't John put this in chapter 1? Why didn't he begin the book of John by saying, all right, let me tell you, before I start writing, let me tell you why I'm going to write this. Now, I don't know why he puts it at the end, but notice a couple things that he says. Verse 40, 31 again, these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is a Messiah, the Son of God. We said in the very outset, you're going to see that word believe all the way through his gospel. In fact, you saw in chapter 1, you go all the way and we get to the very end and we're still seeing that word. And I hope this morning, as we look at this word, that you fully understand what it means to believe in Jesus. I thought this week as we were wrapping this up, what a tragedy it would be for you to go through the entire book of John and still not understand what it means to believe. But it also says there, not only that we believe that Jesus is a Messiah, the Son of God, but by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. What does that mean? Well, we're going to look at those two this morning. I put in your notes just kind of the summary of what John was saying in verse 31. Here it is. The purpose of the gospel of John is that we believe, write that down, believe in Jesus and have life, write that down, have life by the power of his name. Now, John's going to help us really to define what it means to believe in Jesus, and he's going to do it through a statement that Thomas makes, and we're going to look at that. Now, let me, let me just say this. When you read this passage like we just did, and you, you hear about Thomas's doubting, Thomas gets a bad name. In fact, Thomas is known by many people as Doubting Thomas, and they get it right out of this passage right here, that he told his, his friends, he said, listen, I don't care what you say. Yeah, you say Jesus, you've seen him, he's alive. I won't believe it until I see him myself. But can I just tell you, the disciples didn't, they didn't believe Jesus was alive either. I mean, when they went to the tomb, Peter and John went to the tomb uh, to check out what Mary Magdalene has said. I don't think they, they believed that Jesus was alive. They were thinking what Mary said, that his body had gotten stolen. And obviously, they were locked up in a room there in Jerusalem, so they were, they, they were not really strong in their faith, believing that Jesus was going to resurrect on the third day. So they were no different, really, than Thomas. They were all doubting. Thomas just gets a bad rap here. But notice what Thomas says. Go back and look at verse 28. In fact, look at what Jesus said right before that. He said, Thomas, don't be faithless any longer. And then he says this, believe. Believe. Now notice what Thomas says next. My Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. What? What Thomas was doing here was giving a confession. I mean, just get the scene. Jesus has now appeared in this room, locked. They were locked behind the door. And, and can you just imagine? I mean, Jesus didn't come to the door and... No, he, they didn't open it and let him come in. He wasn't hollering, hey, guys, open the door, unlock it, let me in. No, it just says he appeared. Now, again, we read that, we believe it. That's what John wrote it never happened to me. I don't think anybody here has a story of somebody, you know, just appearing in your room. So imagine the disciples, just what they were experiencing right then. Here, Thomas, 
They had already appeared one time to the disciples Jesus had. Eight days later, now he stands in the room again. And Thomas is there. And I guarantee you, Thomas's eyes got big. And Jesus tells him, Thomas, put your hands. Look at my hands. Put your hands in these, these nail holes. Look at my side. This is where I was pierced when I was on the cross. Look at my, look at my feet. And then Thomas makes this incredible confession. My Lord, my God. What does it mean to believe in Jesus? Well, first, it means that you confess that Jesus is Lord. You confess he is Lord. That's what Thomas was doing. Believing in Jesus is believing who he says he is. That's what Thomas, Thomas had heard Jesus proclaim and teach that he was God, saw all these miracles, had been with him for three years. It wasn't until the resurrection and Thomas saw him face to face with the scars in his body that he would make this confession. And listen, that confession, that, that statement of what we believe is so important. Now, you can ask the question, well, how do we know what we believe. Well, go down and look at what Jesus said in verse 29. He tells Thomas, he says, okay, you believe because you've seen me. How did you put your faith and trust in Christ? Anybody in here see Jesus when you did that? No. You read the Gospels. Notice what Jesus says, blessed are those who believe without seeing me. What does that mean? That means you read it. That means somebody told you what the Bible says. We know the gospel. We know what, what Jesus, who Jesus is because the Bible says he came to this earth. How do we know that? The Bible says he did. He was fully God and fully man. How do we know that? The Bible says he was. That's who he says of, that he was about himself. The Bible says he died on the cross for our sins. How do we know that? According to the scriptures. And he was buried and the third day he rose from the grave. How do we know that? Because of the scriptures. We put our faith and trust in what the Bible says about who Jesus is. So what does it mean to believe in Jesus? It means to trust what the Bible says about who he is. And that confession is so important. That's what Thomas was doing in a very simple statement. My Lord, my God. He was saying, Jesus, you are God. You are who you say you are. Now, it would have been great if he would have said that long before that, but the resurrection sealed it. It sealed it for those disciples. It seals it for you and I. We just came out of celebrating Easter, and that's why the resurrection is so important to our faith, because as we read about the fact that Jesus rose from the grave, we know that Jesus was God. Believing in Jesus means a confession of who he is. But now, let me just tell you, Believing in Jesus is not just head knowledge. It, it, we've said this before. You go up to somebody and say, you know, do you believe in Jesus? Yes, I believe in Jesus. Then you ought to congratulate them and say, so does Satan. So believing in Jesus, just the confession, is not what's required of fully believing in Jesus. Satan believes in Jesus. He's just not going to heaven. Because believing in Jesus is not only a confession of who he is, but it's a commitment to follow him as Lord. Look again at what Thomas says, my Lord. Now that word Lord there means master. And, and notice he didn't say Lord and God. He said my Lord, my God. And so what Thomas was doing was basically at that moment saying, Lord, I commit my life to follow you. You are the master of my life. I give you my life. Believing in Jesus is not just a head knowledge. It's a heart knowledge, and it's a decision of your will. It's a decision to say, I will follow you. I'll make that choice now to follow you. If, if you remember when we baptize, and we've talked about this before, if you see and listen to a baptism here, we ask the person two questions. One, have you trusted Jesus? Have you believed in Jesus? And we meet with people before they're baptized just to make sure they understand what you believe. It's what you're believing lining up with Scripture. But then the second question, 
Have you committed to follow him for the rest of your life? You see, there's a lot of people that, again, say or think believing in Jesus is just believing some things about him. But believing in Jesus is a confession about him, and that's important, but it's also a commitment. You're committing your life to follow him. Jesus gave a, he gave a great parable, a story, uh, when he was talking with his disciples. And, and this is a story he gave us in Matthew chapter 13. He said, he said, there was a man one day that saw this field, and it had treasure hidden in it. And he, found, he finds this treasure I mean, it's an amazing treasure in this field. And the Bible says he goes and he sells everything he has and buys this field. Now, you read that story and you go, okay, what's the meaning here? Okay, he sees a field. It's got treasure in it. He sells everything he has to buy this field. So what's the point? Well, here's the point. You look at that field, just like the man did, and you go, oh, my gosh. You realize how valuable this field is? This is an amazing field. It's got treasure hidden in it. That's the connection about the field. And, and that was a part of the story, the parable that Jesus gave him. The man had a confession. Hey, he discovered the field was full of treasure. That was a good thing. But he sells everything he has to buy the field. Now, what does that mean? That means when you come to Christ, there is a confession of who Jesus is, who he says he is according to Scripture. But it's also in believing in Jesus, committing your life to him. Jesus would say, count the cost. Take up your cross daily and follow me. There's a lot of people that, again, have, have made Jesus their Savior, but Lordship, I love what Jason said, if you caught that. He said, Jesus is my Savior, and he's my Lord. They go together. When Jesus said, hey, this man sold everything he had, he gave everything he had to purchase the field. Believing in Jesus means we give him our life. We give him everything we have. You just give up and say, Jesus, you are my master. And I, I, again, I love how Thomas made it so personal. My Lord, my God. You see, salvation and believing in Jesus is a personal decision. When I, when I was a youth minister, I shared this at the beginning, but when I was a youth minister, what really bothered me, and, and I struggled with it, was every year at camp, we would take we take hundreds of kids. I mean, our camps were, were big, and it was just an a, a amazing time, and a lot of kids that we took were lost. And so a lot of our emphasis in youth camp in that day back then was, was salvation. And so I'd bring a camp pastor in that was real good at presenting the gospel. And we would see a lot of kids get saved. But months later, I would have kids come into my office and going. Man, I'm struggling. I just don't have that feeling like I had Thursday night at camp. I, I just, I don't know. I'm struggling because I, I, I just don't know if God's with me. I don't have that same feeling. I want to get that feeling back. And then I began to realize salvation cannot be an emotional decision. Now, emotions are not wrong, but your decision to believe in Jesus is based on your understanding of who he is and your will, your, your choice, your decision in committing your life to follow him. I've had a lot of people since I've been a pastor that struggle with doubt, just not sure if they're saved or not. And, and you know, where do you take a person like that? You, you take them back to the foundation. First of all, what do you believe? Let's go back to the gospel. Let's go back and, and read the gospel and see what it means to be a follower of Christ. And then sometimes in doing that and moving a little further, we find that that commitment to follow him is where the struggle is. Because when you commit to follow him, you're turning from your sin and you're trusting Jesus. And so you're turning from a life that was heading towards sin, now you're heading towards righteousness. And so if, if you're still walking in the same direction and caught up in that, yeah, you're going to doubt. You're going to struggle. 
So just understand, I want to make it clear before we move off of this, especially in the book of John as we conclude it, believing in Jesus is confessing that he is who he said he is and committing to follow him for the rest of your life. Go back and look at verse 31 again. You believe that Jesus is a Messiah, the Son of God, and believing in him, you will have life in the power of his name. You will have life in the power of his name. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean to have life in the power of his name? Well, three things. I'll put them there in your notes. Here's the first one. When you went from death, which is the way we all were before we accepted Christ, to now we're alive. In other words, the Bible says our sin has separated us from God. We were apart from God. We had no relationship with God. Now that you've been put back together, and that word is reconciliation, you've been reconciled to God. Your relationship was separate, and now it's together. It's it's a picture of of a husband and wife that that separate, and, and they get back together. Their marriage has been reconciled. That's what happens when you became a Christian. You were separated from God, and now you're joined back with him. And so the first thing we experience in that life is now we have a relationship with God. You live in relationship with Christ. Now, I want to ask you this morning, how is your relationship with Jesus? If you're a Christian, that's the best way to, really, a a description of your life now as a Christian. I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not about religion. It's, It's about your daily walk with the Lord. You now know him. You have been adopted into his family. I love how, again, going back to Jason's testimony, I love how he began his story. Hey, I, I was adopted twice. <laughs> adopted in my, my earthly family, but I was adopted by God into our spiritual family. When you became a Christian, when you believed, you were given life, new life, a life that involved now a relationship, a family relationship. God is now your father. Second, this is going back to Scripture. Write this down. Not only do we live in a relationship with Jesus, we live on mission for Jesus. We live on mission for Jesus. Look again at verse 21. Notice what Jesus says here. He says, peace be with you. And then he makes this statement. In fact, we'll read all the way through verse 23. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sin, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are forgiven. Now, what did we just read here? What we just read was the Great Commission. That doesn't sound like the Great Commission. Typically what we recite as the Great Commission is um, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's the Matthew account. But can I tell you, every gospel writer records a part of what Jesus gave the disciples as the commission. Mark, you get to the end of the book of Mark, and, and Mark records Jesus telling his disciples before he's ascended, hey, go and preach the gospel all over the world. Luke, you get to the end of Luke, and Luke kind of records it a little different. He's a, he's a doctor, so he goes more into the technical part and, and begins to talk about the Holy Spirit, talk about what we're to 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 teach. And then when you get to the book of Acts, which is written by Luke, Luke again records the Great Commission. We know it in chapter 1, verse 8 as this, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be my witnesses. That was Jesus speaking. That That was the Great Commission that Luke records. John, what does he record Jesus saying? Well, first he says, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. I mean, there's our, there, there's our direction for our life. We are sent, just like Jesus was sent. And, and you'll find that uh, several months ago on Friday morning in our men's Bible study, we were going through the upper room chapters of chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. And when you get to chapter 17, in this prayer Jesus is praying, we looked at it several weeks ago, Jesus prays this, Lord, as you have sent me, I will send them. And then Jesus says it again right here. 
Well, back then, I did a study of how many times John references Jesus being sent. Over 37 times in the book of John, you'll find either Jesus saying himself, the Father has sent me, or John just referring to Jesus as being sent. And so that is a huge point about Jesus. He was sent here by the Father. He was sent on mission. He was sent. And then notice what he says here in verse 21. As the Father has sent me, as the Father, just like the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. When you, when you get up in just a minute, well, a few minutes, and walk out of here, service is over, go to your car, go home, whatever you got planned, the best way for you to walk out of here on a Sunday morning is to walk out of here with a sense that you are sent. That means you have a mission. Sometimes we'll dismiss and say, you know, God bless you, love you, have a great day, see you next Sunday. I, I, I thought about that again this week, and I thought, you know what? The best way we can say the service is over is now that the service is over, you're going out these doors on mission. You are sent. You don't just walk out and go, well, what are we going to do today? No, you walk out as Jesus was sent, so are you. It would be as if Jesus is standing up here on a Sunday morning and saying, all right, it's 12 o'clock. As you leave, know you're being sent. I'm sending you. Notice what else he says. He says he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, that, that's been a verse that has caused a lot of question. What did he mean by that? If this is a part of the Great Commission, which, which it is, it's a part of what Jesus was saying to his disciples, why did he say this, that he breathed on them and received the Holy Spirit? I mean, did Jesus go, hey guys, get, get, get around me. All right, you ready? Uh -uh, he didn't do that. You say, well, it says he breathed on them and said, he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Well, what Jesus was saying here was reminding them of what he had already told them back in the upper room, that he would send them the Holy Spirit when he leaves. He would, he would give them the Holy Spirit. In fact, we know later, before he ascended, he told them, he said, hey, go back to Jerusalem and wait on the Holy Spirit. So it wasn't that Jesus said, all right, I'm going to give you a little bit of the Holy Spirit right here. <sighs> Got it? And then they'd somehow lose the Holy Spirit and have to go back to Jerusalem and wait on it for Pentecost. No. All Jesus was saying is a part of how John was recording what he was teaching them about the Great Commission. One of the great parts of being on mission with Jesus is you're going to have his presence with you. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. When does the Holy Spirit come upon us? In the moment you believe. In the moment you trust Christ you give him your life, there is, a, there is a, a, a transformation that takes place that Jesus comes now to live in your heart, and he says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So when he's saying here, you will receive the Holy Spirit, that's going to come in Pentecost. They will remember that, that 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 was a part of the experience of Pentecost. The, the, the wind, remember when they were up a room, there was a wind. Well, Jesus was saying here, he breathed on them. That was the breath of God. And they would experience in that upper room there at Pentecost the filling of the Holy Spirit in their lives. But notice what else he says. Verse 23, here's another one that's kind of hard to understand. He says, if you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. Now let me tell you what he's not saying here. He's not giving his disciples some special power and ability to go around forgiving people's sins. Only Jesus could do that. Only he had the power to forgive sins. So what's he saying here when he said, hey, if you forgive anyone's sin, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they are not forgiven. Well, it goes back to the message of the Great Commission. It goes back to, to what message we are taking and giving to people as his ambassadors. It's the message of the good news that you can have your sins forgiven. And when somebody believes and puts their trust and faith in Christ based on the authority of Scripture, we can tell them, your sins have been forgiven. 
We didn't forgive their sins. Jesus did. But based on the authority of what the scriptures tell us, we can tell someone, yeah, your sins have been forgiven. Again, people come to me and they're, they're struggling with salvation. I take them back to the gospel and said, have you put your faith and trust that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? Yes, I did. Then by the authority of scripture, I can tell you he's forgiven all of your sins. Yeah, that past sin that you're struggling with, he died on the cross for it. Your sins, all your sins have been forgiven. We as Christians can, can proclaim that because that's what the scriptures tell us. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Again, somebody rejects the gospel, you can, by, by confidence of the scripture and the authority of scripture, tell them you're still in your sins. And if you die in your sins, you'll spend eternity in hell. How can you say that? I don't. The Bible does. That's what God says. I don't send you to hell. I'm just telling you what the scriptures say. All right? You got that? All right, let's move to the third one. You got, um, we live in a relationship with Jesus. We live on mission for Jesus. And here's the third, and I'll close with this. We live in the blessing of Jesus. We live in the blessing of Jesus. Go back to verse, um, go back to verse 19 again. It says in the midway of that verse, suddenly Jesus was standing there among them. We got that picture. And then he says this, peace be with you. And he says in verse 20, he spoke and he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. He says peace with you again in verse 21. And you go down to verse 26. He says it the third time, peace be with you. Each time, it would be a reminder to them of what he had already promised them. He promised them peace. You go back to chapter 14. Just let me show it to you. Look again at verse 27 of chapter 14. I'm leaving you with a gift. This is Jesus speaking to him before he's crucified. I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Remember what I told you. I am going away, but I will come back to you again. Now, he's not just referring to just the resurrection, because he would come back to them, but he would also leave again. He would ascend, but he would send to them the Holy Spirit, his presence. Every time that he said, peace be with you, it was to be associated with his presence. They were in the room, no Jesus, doors were locked, all of a sudden Jesus appears, and what does he tell them? Peace be with you. He says it again in verse 21, and he goes through them again in verse 26, and he says the same thing, peace be with you. One of the blessings that we, we live in as followers of Christ is the blessing of his presence, that we have peace because of his presence. I, I thought about that this week. I, I've been really burdened about just folks that are hurting right now. There's been, there's been loss of life. Um, this young lady, a uh, 17-year-old, was going was gonna to graduate, died this week. And uh, my heart just went out to this family, to friends that she knew, and, and I, I can't imagine just the things that are going on in a lot of people's hearts that are hurting. Um, in fact, you'd be praying. There's a possibility that we'll have her funeral here this week. And I, I thought about, you know, how many times I've prayed for people to have peace. And we do that. I mean, you, you see somebody that's struggling, and one of the things you pray, God, comfort them. God, give them peace. But can I tell you this? The peace that Jesus gives is with his presence. If you're praying for peace for somebody that doesn't have Jesus in their heart, then our prayer should be that they would come to know Jesus. Not just to have the byproduct of peace, but they would know Jesus. Because if you know Jesus, you'll know peace. It's a gift. The gift of the Holy Spirit comes with the gift of peace. That's what Jesus told his disciples. Maybe some of you this morning are sitting here and you're struggling because 
you've had times where you've lost your peace and maybe people have prayed for you but I, I pray that what you've discovered when you get that peace is that you come back to to your belief your faith that Jesus said I'll never leave you nor forsake you you can comfort somebody with those words I've done that many many times at two funerals yesterday and, and just meeting with the families this past week and talking about the funeral services that were yesterday, just assuring them about God's presence in our life gives us peace, gives us comfort. You, you, you don't buy peace at a store. It's not a product that you can get and, and, and put it in your life. No, it comes in knowing Jesus. That's what we see here in the Scripture. Jesus showed up, and what happened? He told his disciples, peace be with you. And then John just adds this, they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. They, they went from being scared, grieving, upset, to now they're in the presence of Jesus. And what happens? They have peace and they have joy. Now, I want to close with this. Go down and look at verse 29. Last thing Jesus says here in, verse, in chapter 20. He tells Thomas, you believe because you have seen me. Okay, we've looked at that. Now notice what else he says. Blessed, blessed are those who believe without seeing. Now we made a comment about that a while ago. But look at the word blessed. That word blessed, if you read it in Matthew where you see the Beatitudes, blessed art thou, I mean there's, there's a whole group of them there. It literally means happy. Being blessed in, in one sense, in one definition of the word, it means happy. But here, the definition of the word is different. In fact, the word blessed here means accepted by God. When, when you read what Jesus said, blessed are those who believe without seeing, your blessing is that you are accepted by God. You live in that blessing. I, a long time ago, we kind of made a joke. We said, you know, somebody comes up to you and says, hey, how are you doing? Instead of saying, fine or good or whatever, just look at him and say, I'm blessed. And, and I've caught flack over that. It's like, okay, you know, if we don't say it, we're going to get in trouble with the pastor. No, 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 no. But as I looked at that this week and studied that word again to see what, what does that mean, it, it literally means accepted by God. So when somebody says, hey, how are you doing? <laughs> you can get even more specific and say, I'm accepted by God. I am accepted by God. That's what it means to live your life in the Jesus' name. That's what it means to have life, that you realize you're living your life accepted by God. So let me go back to the question I began with. Have you believed in Jesus? You read the entire book of John, and that's what you find when you get to the end is a question. Have you trusted Jesus as your Savior? Have you believed what Jesus said? Have you embraced what the Bible says about who he is? And have you committed your life to him? Friend, if you've not done that, on this Sunday where we're closing out chapter 20, the invitation is directly for you to put your faith and trust in Jesus, to believe in Jesus. What does that mean? Make that confession of who he is, believing in your heart. Jesus came to this earth, lived a sinless, perfect life, died on the cross for my sins and rose from the grave. And I put my faith and trust in him. My forgiveness is in him, not by works that I'm saved. I'm saved by grace. Death on the cross by Jesus was a gift for us. We didn't earn it or deserve it. And that, with that confession, you commit. Lord, I make a decision to give you my life. Not only do I call you Savior, you are my Lord. If you're already a Christian, maybe your testimony this morning is without life, the new life that God wants you to have. You were dead, now you're alive. You have a relationship with Jesus. You're on mission. You have purpose for your life. You are blessed. Is that you? If it's not, then line your life up with what I think John made sure that we knew as he closed this book out. 
Amen? All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this morning. I thank you as John has written a book that had a purpose of helping us to know how to believe. For us knowing who to believe in and what we're to believe about Jesus. And then, Lord, in believing, Lord, we're to experience life. Lord, I, I thank you for that. What a great book. As we close next week, God, we anticipate just, Lord, a, another, another journey in a, in a part of the, one of the greatest books in the Bible. It was written for that sole purpose for us to believe and in believing have eternal life. Lord, we thank you. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jacob's going to lead us in a closing song this morning, and I, I want to I just encourage you that we've sung this song before, but I love the words, the simplicity of, of, of what we're singing to the Lord. I believe, and it, it goes through the Trinity and just basic things that we can sing and leave out of here this morning praising the Lord for that belief that the Scripture gives us. If, you, uh, if you're struggling right now, you want to come and pray at this altar, I will invite you to do that. It's, it's here as a way for you just to come and kneel and pray. Um, if you want to talk with somebody, need somebody to pray with, I'm going to be standing right down here. I just come and, and, and we'll be I'd be glad to visit with you after the service or anytime this next week. I'm thankful and grateful that you're here this morning. Uh, let's stand and, uh, and sing this together.
hearts with me. God, we thank you so much. There's not some complicated way to be back in a relationship with you, God. That's how life once was back in the beginning. It was just simple in a relationship with you, God, but sin wreaked havoc on our lives and we have been separated. And Jesus, when you came, you died on the cross to take away our sins. And you died bearing our sins in the grave, rising again, proving that you are the Son of God. And that by believing in you, we may have life in your name. I thank you, God, for your word. God, I thank you for giving Ronnie the words to clearly communicate what life is. And that is in your name by confessing that you are the Son of God who've come to take away our sins and to commit our lives to you as our Lord, our Savior, our Master. And to have all that comes with that, God, being adopted into your family, born again, clean, new, and to receive eternal life. We thank you and we pray that that is our story, and if it's not our story, that that would be our story before this day's over, God. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Like the word said, we're on mission. Let's go get them. <laughs>